First John Introduction Author and Title Manuscript evidence is unanimous that someone named John wrote this epistle, which is consistently labelled the first of his extant letters in titles found in ancient copies. But who is this John? For a number of reasons, John the son of Zebedee, author of the fourth gospel, is the most likely candidate. Firstly, the style and vocabulary of John's Gospel and 1 John are so similar that a common author is extremely likely. This is particularly evident in the opening verses of the respective documents, but the language of the Gospel echoes across the whole of this epistle. For example, only verbal forms of believe occur about 100 times in John's Gospel, while the noun faith never appears. First John follows suit with nine occurrences of the verbal form of believe and just one use of the word faith. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 Secondly, major themes and emphases of the writing overlap. These include Christ's simultaneous full humanity and divinity, the close relationship between believing, i.e. faith and doctrine, obeying God's commandments, i.e. ethics, and the primacy of love as marking authentic knowledge of the true God through trust in his Son, Christ Jesus. While John is not mentioned by name in the fourth gospel, he was accepted by the early church and by most scholars and Bible commentators today to have been the disciple whom Jesus loved, who sat beside Jesus at the Last Supper. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. John chapter 13 verse 23 Arguments put forward by some scholars that he was Lazarus, an elder John, or a fictional creation are unconvincing. John is the only apostle known to have been an eyewitness of the crucifixion. Shortly before his death, Jesus had entrusted his mother Mary into John's care. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. John chapter 19 verses 26 to 27 It is widely accepted that Mary travelled with John to Ephesus over thirty years later, so had remained with him all that time. Along with Peter, John witnessed the empty tomb on the first Easter morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. John chapter 20 verses 1 to 10 he also saw, spoke with, and ate breakfast at a lakeside fire with Jesus, along with Peter and the others who had been fishing the previous night, as recorded in John chapter 21. John was therefore highly qualified to write of what he and the others had heard, seen, looked at, and touched, recorded so eloquently in the opening passage of this letter. As a disciple whom Jesus loved, he was also well suited to plumb the depths of the meaning of Jesus' coming, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension and subsequent intercessory ministry at the Father's right hand, and his promise to return to claim his inheritance on the day of judgment, all of which come to the fore through the eyes of this witness, giving sound instruction and admonition in this rich and highly concentrated letter. He also had a good grasp of Jesus' full humanity and simultaneous full deity. Date it is widely held that John was at most 20 years old when he became a disciple of Jesus around AD 30. Thus he would have been in his late 50s at the start of the Roman Jewish War of AD 67 to 70. By the time he wrote this letter, he was the only one of the apostles still alive, as all the others had been martyred by that time.
He died in approximately AD 100, apparently of natural causes, at some point after personally receiving Christ's revelation. This is not unexpected due to a conversation that had been held on the occasion that Jesus had appeared to them in Galilee after his resurrection. Speaking to Peter, Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. John chapter 21 verse 22 Early post-apostolic figures like Polycarp and Papias, circa AD 100, presuppose or cite 1 John in their own writings. This suggests a date of composition no later than the 90s, with the mid-80s preferred by many. This dovetails with the testimony of church fathers that, at the start of the Jewish-Roman War in AD 67, John left Jerusalem prior to its destruction by the Romans. Historians, including Josephus and Philo, claim that between 580,000 and 1.1 million people died in the Jewish-Roman War, but that no Christians died at all in the siege of Jerusalem. John reportedly resumed his apostolic ministry in the vicinity of the great but highly idolatrous city of Ephesus, in modern-day western Turkey. He likely wrote 1 John as an elder statesman of the faith in the last third of the first century, perhaps to churches in the surrounding region. This might have included towns like those mentioned alongside Ephesus in the opening chapters of Revelation, that is, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Refer to Revelation chapter 2 verse 8 to Revelation chapter 3 verse 22 for details of the letters written to those churches. Theme In 1 John, the author calls readers back to the three basics of Christian life, true doctrine, obedient living and fervent devotion. Because God is light, 1 John chapter 1 verse 5b, Christ's followers can and should overcome evildoers who seek to subvert them. The one who lives in and among them, God's Son, is greater than the spirit of the Antichrist, who John warned was already a threat to the early church. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. 1 John chapter 4 verse 3 Anyone who believes in the name of the Son of God and accepts him as their personal Lord and Saviour has the assurance of everlasting life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13 Purpose of 1 John There is a school of thought that suggests all three of John's epistles were written to form a single packet. 3 John was a personal letter to a dear and trusted friend of John, named Gaius. 2 John was then written to be read to Gaius' own church, with 1 John to be read to that church and then passed on to others in the province of Asia, as a general sermon. If all three are read together in reverse order, this will make sense. This is an interesting thesis, and there is evidence within the letters to support it, but no other evidence exists. It is customary among some scholars to understand 1 John as a response to the rise of an early form of Gnosticism. This was a religious mysticism that pirated Christian motives to propagate an understanding of salvation based on esoteric knowledge, Greek Gnosis. According to this view, redemption is through affirming the divine light already in the human soul, not through repentance of sin and faith in Christ's death, to bring about a spiritual rebirth. Writings widely publicised in recent years, like the Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of Judas, for example, were products of Gnostic writers. But the heyday of Gnostic thought was the 2nd to 5th centuries, well after the time the New Testament books were written. It can neither be proven nor ruled out that John had this or a similar movement in mind as he wrote. John wrote to Christians who had witnessed an exodus from their ranks, mostly drawn away by false teachers described by other New Testament authors. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 And, But certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men, who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Jude verse 4 
as well as by John in this letter. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. 1 John chapter 2 verse 19 However, this does not mean that all John wrote should be interpreted as a response to schism. John is neither anti-Gnostic or anti-schismatic. John's focus is positive, not polemical. His aim is redemptive, not reactionary. He urges readers to refine their theological understanding, sharpen their ethical rigour, and heighten their devotional intensity. That is, they must grow in faith, obedience, and love. Yet the letter is not a list of do's and don'ts. It is rather a manifesto of done, where Jesus' words, it is finished, come to mind. John chapter 19 verse 30b This letter highlights what God the Father has done in sending God the Son, offering him up as an atoning sacrifice for the whole world's sins, and sending forth the word of life. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1e Which John puts forward as a new command. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. 1 John chapter 2 verse 8 God's action becomes the mandate of those who believe in his Son, for the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. 1 John chapter 2 verse 17 God's will is for John's readers to receive the saving message of Christ's coming, rejoice in the commands of Christ's teaching, and revel in the love of the Father as it continually translates into Christian love for one another and its ministry to the world. This is to be true love in action. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. 1 John chapter 3 verse 18 Summary of Salvation History Christians are to live in love as Christ loved us. They are to endure the suffering for the sake of Christ, looking back on Christ's suffering and forward to the consummation of salvation at his second coming. Writing Style This document lacks certain earmarks of a typical Hellenistic letter. For example, the writer does not name himself at the outset, as Paul always does, unless of course he was the author to the Hebrews, a much contested point of discussion since the early centuries of Christianity. And the book is somewhat sermonic in tone. Yet on several counts it is highly letter-like, as seen from the express motive of shared joy, i.e., we write this to make our joy complete. 1 John chapter 1 verse 4 The repeated mentions of the act and purpose of writing to his recipients, with 13 uses of the Greek verb I we write or I am writing, and the many instances of the direct address to the readers. First John was judged to be in the form of a letter by ancient writers such as Arrhenius, Dionysius of Alexandria, and Eusebius, who would have understood the prevailing conventions of letter writing. The rhetoric of First John is challenging. John rarely sustains a clear line of argument for more than a few lines or verses. He wanders from subject to subject, unencumbered by any discernible outline. Yet if he has no plan, he does follow a pattern. After leaving a subject, he often returns to it. His style of thought has been termed circular rather than linear. It has also been termed symphonic, in that he states themes, moves away from them, and then revisits them with variations, as any good composer would. While the rhetoric of 1 John poses difficulties, its content is rich in doctrinal substance, ethical challenge, and devotional fervour. John is insistent that no one has ever seen God the Father in his unmediated glory, yet just as insistent that to know Jesus is to know the true God and eternal life. The mystery of this dialectic suffuses the letter from start to finish and moves John to write with insight, consistency, intensity and depth. Yet his language is, for the most part, simple and his vocabulary modest. Line for line there are few biblical writings that surpass 1 John in the imposing demands made on the reader, along with the rich rewards that studied interpretation will yield. 1 John is ostensibly an epistle but its content is more fluid than that found in most New Testament letters. There is no epistolary salutation, nor is there a conventional epistolary conclusion. A more accurate designation is to call the book a treatise or pamphlet. Alternatively, it can be read as an address or loosely structured sermon. The topic changes with virtually every paragraph, so the best advice for reading the book is to think paragraphs. Nevertheless, even though the structure of 1 John is not strictly linear, 
The author keeps coming back to topics that have been introduced earlier, so that readers can profitably think of the book as being arranged like a musical symphony. The main theme is testing, by which a believer can know if he has the correct mindset and attitude that authenticate his claims to be a follower of Jesus. Under that umbrella, subordinate themes appear. Christology, doctrine about the person and work of Christ, walking in the light, love, and the need to reject fallen worldly culture. These topics weave in and out of the book. The book is structured on an implied dialectic principle in which John continuously seeks to oppose viewpoints that are contrary to his assertions. For example, John's assertions that Christ has come in the flesh are an implied refutation of those who deny the Incarnation. Finally, there is an incipient poetry and mysticism about John's writing, so that a lot of what John asserts about the Christian life is embodied in great symbols like light and darkness, or walking and abiding in Christ. Key Themes 1. The one eternal God became incarnate in his Son, Jesus the Christ, who is the true God, the Word, and eternal life. 2. All humans are sinful, but Christians have joyful fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with each other through repentance and faith in Jesus as the Christ. 3. Christ is a believer's advocate with the Father and the propitiation for their sins. 4. Those who know Christ forsake sin and keep God's commands, in particular the command to love God, each other and their neighbour. 5. Denial of Jesus Christ as God's Son in the flesh is denial of God the Father. 6. Faith in Christ results in forgiveness of sins, eternal life, confidence in prayer, protection from the evil one, and understanding and knowing the true God. Setting of 1 John John likely wrote 1 John from Ephesus, where apparently he had relocated before the time of the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans in AD 70. Many hold that he travelled there with Jesus' mother Mary. The letter was probably intended to be read by the church in Ephesus, and most likely by other churches in the surrounding cities. Ephesus was a wealthy and highly influential port city in the Roman province of Asia, which was renowned for its temple of the Greek goddess Artemis, known as Diana by the Romans. There is an image given an artist's impression of the temple of Artemis, one of the wonders of the ancient world. There is a map that shows the main cities in Asia during the 1st century AD. Outline John writes in a style that is not the accepted norm for a 1st century Hellenistic epistle, although it was accepted by famous writers and authors of that generation as having been a letter, and so we should accept it as such. John does not write in a planned linear style, but as a circular pattern of thought, revisiting themes several times throughout the letter, but doing so in a way that brings the whole letter to life, with so much to be found in such a brief document. For the purposes of study, it breaks down into six major sections. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 to 1 John chapter 2 verse 17 God is light and Christ is love. John begins his letter by directing the reader's attention to Christ's divinity, incarnation, saving sacrificial death and intercessory ministry in heaven. He also stresses God's ineffable brilliance and the ubiquity of human sin. That God is light reflects an Old Testament background where light symbolizes both knowledge and purity. All of John's writing flows from the reality of God in his spiritual perfection, moral excellence and utter transcendence, his light. This will contrast sharply with the errant humans protesting their innocence. The light that God sheds on daily living comes through his Son. John's focus then shifts to the commandment to love and the challenge of living out the Christian message in a world where darkness and the evil ones seem to dominate. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18 to 1 John chapter 3 verse 10 Overcoming Antichrist by Confession of the Son John sketches details of the challenges that believers face and how these may be surmounted. The existence of the Antichrist and those trying to deceive believers is alarming, but John is confident that they can find the resources to abide in Christ, who is stronger than any foe and able to protect all that remain in him. Having reaffirmed his reader's commitment to the true Son of God, not the Antichrist, 
John urges them to strive for the ethical integrity and sense of urgency appropriate to their spiritual identity, to confess the Son and to have the Father profoundly alters daily living. 1 John chapter 3 verse 11 to 1 John chapter 4 verse 6 Overcoming evil by listening to the Apostle The beginning of this section, this is the message you heard from the beginning, 1 John chapter 3 verse 11, and its summary, we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, 1 John chapter 4 verse 6. Mark these verses as describing how to avoid the practice of sinning and lawlessness. During his earthly ministry, Jesus had pointed to the devil as the arch liar and murderer. Here, John uses the example of Cain to introduce discussion of what Christians must both avoid and pursue. It is not only Cain's bad precedent of lack of love that John fears for his readers, it is also the forces of spiritual deception. John furnishes a litmus test to detect them. In essence, those who hear and accept good teaching based on the word of God will prevail against the forces of evil. 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 to 21 God's love and ours. John writes extensively on the characteristics of true love in a similar way to that of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. True love comes from God as it is embedded in his essence and anyone who belongs to God should radiate that true love through their own actions and lifestyle choices. God had demonstrated his love for all creation by sending his son as an atoning sacrifice that would be the propitiation for sin. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. This enabled all those who would accept this gift of love to be able to come back into relationship with God the Father. Therefore, Christian love is a gift from God, demonstrated supremely in the cross. God's love always takes the initiative, and the love of Christians is a response to that love. Likewise, all morally good human actions are good, not because they conform to an arbitrary human standard of good, but because they are rooted in imitation of the morally perfect character of God, in whose image all humans were created, and conform to God's commands. 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 to 12 Faith in the Son of God so far, John has spoken quite a bit about love and obedience, but not so much of faith. The emphasis now shifts to believing in the Son. Of the ten references to believing by John in this letter, seven are in chapter 5. The road to love is such a great matter to John, for it is paved with faith in Christ. Having taught and urged so many things in his letter, John underscores the basis for his authority the testimony of God in the coming of Jesus, which John personally witnessed. 1 John chapter 5 verses 13 to 21 Concluding Remarks John summarizes and extends many things already discussed. Noah occurs seven times in these verses, indicating his focus on the assurance and even certainty of Christian faith and salvation. Prayer is central to a living faith. By refining his readers' understanding of prayer, John promotes healthy and growing faith. The letter concludes on a note of high confidence and deep spiritual insight. Introduction to 1 John ends.